Hey everyone, it's me, your friend Pat. We're here for another exciting episode of Measuring Dev Skills with Code Signal. And I have the pleasure of being joined by Michael Newman. Uh, Michael leads the product engineering team here at Code Signal. So welcome to the show. Thanks, Pat. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> awesome. So one thing I've noticed, Michael, is that somebody who's maybe a, a tech lead using our product, they might look at our library of tasks and say, oh, wow, you've got over 4,000 tasks. That's nice, but I kind of have an idea of the assessment that I want to offer. So today I wanted to go over some of the ways that we're continuing to empower our users to be able to use this product in order to create their own assessments. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, as a hiring manager who sends tests uh, for my own candidates, um, that's definitely something that I do as, as well. Uh, you know, it's nice to build your own questions sometimes if you have a clear idea in mind. Um, and we have the, the task types and the, you know, the UI to, to do that on CodeSignal. Awesome. So I'm going to hit the create task button. First thing we notice is that there are a few more extra types since the last time we looked, but I want to start by looking at the familiar ones. So going right into single function, we see a lot of the same features, including stuff like random tests, these nice sort of quality of life features that we've seen before. Uh, we see a few new features, but before we even dive into those, I just want to talk about sort of the, the facelift that this has had because uh, we have these tabs over here now. It, it kind of feels like like everything is a little more where a new user would expect it to be. Um, so I think I've heard this expression before in terms of uh, UX or designing a UI that you don't want to make the user think, right? That's that's right. I mean, there are different ways of, of putting it, um, you know, minimizing the complexity of, of getting to an action, whether that's minimizing clicks or if you're going to have more clicks, making sure they're well-organized clicks um, so that you're able to to find things in a way that is intuitive to you um, is important. Right, yeah, so I, I mean, just something as simple as like, if we wanted to just preview the description, we've got this little tab right here, right? We don't need to save our uh, task and then go in and look at it and see what the description's looking like. Uh, we've got an overall preview of the whole thing. It just seems a little more convenient for a new user. And I mean, we can see exactly how to do this stuff. There, there aren't really any mysteries about it, right? That's right, yeah. The different levels of previews help you get a really quick idea of if I'm building this task, what is it going to look like to the candidate as they're as they're solving it? Right. So then uh, in terms of some of the newer features that are here, I mean, I, I can't help but notice enable network access. We've got these labels down here. We've got this timeout tab. Uh, let's start with the network access. What's this one all about? So in some uh, languages and for some types of questions, you may want to uh, have logic that requests um, data from an external service. So for example, you might want to make an API request or um, even download a file, or if you're writing bash, maybe you want to run curl or something like that. Um, by default, uh, our single function task type doesn't allow that kind of thing because usually for a logical type of task where you have an input and an output, you shouldn't be relying on external resources or APIs. But uh, if you specifically want to test those things, like can you fetch from an API and process the data, then you can enable this flag and we will um, stop uh, <laughs> isolating the sandbox uh, in which your code runs so that you're actually able to make those requests. So if I was designing an assessment, I could have something like uh, requiring the user to make a request from the Google Maps API or something like that and processing exactly, that Exactly, yeah. So, you know, whether it's load a tweet from Twitter's API and then process it and in some way, um, something that a front-end developer might do or a developer who um, is making requests from server to server, it, it allows capturing a certain kind of um, skill of working across systems that may be a little bit more realistic to a production um, application. Right, a little closer to the actual responsibilities of the dev we might want to hire for something like that, right? That's right, right. Incredible. Uh, so, I mean, I remember this is the sort of thing I, I definitely, when creating a task, used to have to get in contact with, uh, you know, the, the team leaders and stuff like that to make these kinds of modifications. And uh, actually, speaking of which, another one of those is this timeout thing. So looking at this, it looks like we're sort of customizing how long a given language will run the tests before deciding this is too long, right? That's right. Yeah. So, you know, the time limit defines how long the program will have to run before we say this has taken long enough. Um, let's let's shut it down. It's timed out. 
Um, depending on the kind of algorithm and the test cases that you're running, you may want to adjust some of these numbers. Sometimes you may want to adjust it for one language, but not another, uh, depending on where you might be hitting failure points. So we allow both um, adding time to, to all languages at once. You can just say um, this, you know, we want them to do a sleep command for three seconds. So just add three seconds to all languages. Or if you just notice that you want to make the time for C a little bit stricter, for example, you can you can do that uh, as well. For example, if we wanted to require the user to have a, a certain level of optimization in their algorithm, right? That's right. Like if, if um, you want to make sure that an inefficient solution times out instead of passing, then tweaking uh, the timeout uh, the time limit will help you enforce that it is an efficient solution. And that, that's a little more straightforward than trying to actually tweak the test cases to fit the, the timeout number, right? <laughs> that's right, yeah. So if, if you're able to create some different test cases, knowing that some of them are large, um, and then adjust the time limit, that will definitely be easier than trying to adjust your, your test cases to make sure that they time out at, at the right place. Although um, you could do either, I suppose. I, it makes sense to have that sort of quality of life feature, I think. So, uh, well, thank you for this. Uh, moving on, so like the input output tab, as far as I recall, this was basically inside of the description before. So now we don't really have to scroll down to find that. We can see exactly what to click to put it there. Um, and we sort of have control as well. I can't remember if this was here the last time we looked at this, but we can specifically define how many of the tests that we had we want to be visible, right? That's right. I, th I think when it comes to building tasks that are pleasant to solve, uh, I think it's really important to get the sample test strategy right. Um, so our default behavior here is just uh, hide the last half and show the first half. Uh, and that kind of works generically if you have a bunch of random tests and you haven't thought them through. It wouldn't really be our recommendation for building a task to not think about what you're showing in your sample tests though, because every test case is a chance for you to communicate an expectation to the developer solving the task. So you can show edge cases, you can choose not to show edge cases. You can show simple, well-described examples that match the problem description, um, and you can really help ease them into the complexity of the problem by choosing your sample test as well. As part of that, you know, maybe you want, you don't want to have 10 and 10, maybe you want to have three really good sample tests and then 12 um, hidden ones. So we want to make sure that there's flexibility in configuring that. Yeah, that makes sense being able to have control over that instead of having to produce an equal number of right. uh, visible and hidden tests. That's awesome. Uh, so the only other thing we haven't really talked about here are the labels. How might someone like a tech lead use these labels uh, for their tasks? Yeah, I mean, label. the idea of labels um, hopefully is actually pretty straightforward. Um, we like to use things like GitHub labels as a reference for why you'd want to use these. And it's mostly for organization. It's very flexible. Um, you can create labels. Uh, to describe different types of tasks uh, that you might be interested in. Um, if you're building your own tasks, you know, you may uh, group uh, labels around the kind of question that you're asking or the skills that you're measuring um, or the roles that you are hiring for when you ask these types of questions. And we also have predefined labels that you can use and that are applied to tasks in our pre-built library of tasks that are uh, as you can see here, maybe it's a strings question or an arrays question, and you can use those to sort uh, and look through our, our content as well. Right, so we can more easily find this uh, or our other favorite tasks that we like to give candidates of, of a certain role or something like that, right? I, that's right. We actually also have task favoriting. So I hesitate to say you would need to create a, a label for your favorite tasks um, because you can also just go ahead and star them. Um, if like, for example, as an interviewer, you have a favorite task that you like to occasionally look at. Um, but definitely, you know, there are a lot of tasks. Um, it's important to be able to find the ones that are relevant to you. Um, so providing some flexibility in how you're able to, to categorize them is, is really, really helpful when you're uh, just generally building tasks or building an interview template or, or anything like that. Awesome. Yeah. So we shouldn't have any trouble finding this once we're done with it. Um, <laughs> right. 
So cool. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I can see a lot of uh, empowering features here. I definitely feel more powerful in terms of creating my own single function task. Of course, we have these two other new ones that I'm sure everyone uh, is eyeing right now. So I look forward to talking about those in future episodes. I'm really excited to talk more about file system and SQL tasks, our newest two task types. Uh, they add a lot of um, ability to measure more specialized and complex skills. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Well, thanks so much, Michael, for joining us and showing us how we are continuing to empower our users to be able to create their own task types. Thank you, Pat.